Hi, my name is Brian Caffo, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian, part of our weekly newsletter. So sign up for our newsletter, Monday Morning Data Science. There's a link in the YouTube video description below. And also, if you get a chance, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you can ask a question. There's a link to that in the description below as well. So this week, I'm going to ask kind of, a, or I'm going to answer an important question, which is what is post-selection inference or inference after model selection? So uh, I'm going to assume when you when you do this, you know, or when you're listening to this video, you have a rough idea of what statistical inference is and what type one error rates are, and that you might have run a linear model or a regression, gone down to the coefficients, looked at the p-value, or generated a, a confidence interval, compared your p-value, say, to 0.05, and thought that, hey, that's a 5% level test. That gives me a 5% error rate. Okay. So the idea behind post-model selection inference is, in many cases, you actually don't have a 5% error rate when you do that process. So let me go through it with an example. Imagine you have a clinical trial where you have a treatment variable, let's say x1, that's 1 whether you treated, and 0 if you were a control, and you have some outcome variable y, and you want to relate uh, x1 to y. You want to ascertain whether the treatment is affecting the response, but you have this other potential confounding variable that you want to look at, x2. Okay, so you are considering between two models, model one and model two, that the outcome is just linearly related to the treatment or that the outcome is linearly related to the treatment and potentially including this other variable. Okay, and so I've actually put different parameters, beta naught and beta one versus gamma naught, gamma one and gamma two. I've done that because they're interpreted differently and I wanna emphasize that these are two different models. So if you actually first have some model selection procedure between model one and model two, and then whichever one you select, look at the coefficient in front of x1 and compare its p-value to 0.05, the type 1 error rate may not wind up being 5% for that procedure. So, and the easiest way to see this is to consider something like so-called p-hacking. So imagine if instead of having two, model, two models, you had 10,000 models, and you simply kept putting in and out regressors until the coefficient in front of the x1, in front of the treatment variable, became as significant as possible, okay? Then you can probably guess, well, okay, the type one error rate of that procedure probably isn't 5%, right? I've really rigged the game to make it as likely as possible to get significant. So it can't be just, you know, 5%. I've got to have a much higher than 5% chance of getting significance when I do this. Okay, and th this is the fundamental idea, I think, behind model selection inference is that you have this process the model selection part that you have not accounted for when you're talking about your inference. Now, there's other aspects to this model selection inference that also make it hard. For example, the hypothesis that you're testing is often arrived at randomly through a random model selection process, right? You know, your beta one and gamma one are interpreted differently between these two models. So that's you know another problem. So when you arrive at a model and test it and look at its p-value and compare it to 0.05, and that error rate that you're thinking about in that time is a kind of weird error rate. It's, it's conditioned on that the model that you arrived at is really the correct model or contains the correct model, and B, that uh, the, you're conditioning on the process that it got you to arrive at that model, which is not often the question that you want to answer. So model selection, post-model selection inference adjust for this. It tries to get you to the a correct, a globally correct type 1 error rate. So I think many statisticians think that this is sort of an ugly secret of modern statistics where very often we have the data already collected, we search for models and maybe come up with our hypotheses after the data collection uh, through some kind of complicated model search or maybe using a lasso or something like that, and that that pretending like our error rates and pretending like the model that we arrived at is the true model is a potential real problem. And so I think that's why people are not just interested in this, but they are concerned that, um, that you know, think this is leading to things like p-hacking. Uh, if not, you know, even, even not for nefarious reasons, just for, uh, you, know, you know, people trying out models and not realizing what it does to their error rates. Okay, so um, 
I, I think that gives you a pretty good sense of, you know, just the gist of the problem. It's, it's kind of a comp complicated problem then to work on, actually. Um, so, you know, that's why I think a lot of, you know, some really good statisticians are working on it and there's a lot of interest in it uh, because it's, it's also intrinsically interesting from a mathematical perspective as well. Okay. So I guess I should say maybe a minute about how you can avoid these things. Well, uh, the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration tries to avoid these things by being highly prescriptive in how people run their models. They want people to have a clear protocol set in place ahead of time, uh, and they help create the study design that generates the models. And then they also want people, if there is a model selection, to actually build that into their error rate correction. So I think in the cases where we're really concerned about these sort of things and really concerned about adhering to our type one error rates, like we would in a regulatory agency like the Food and Drug Administration, they actually have long thought of this kind of problem and put in controls to prevent um, you know, uh, spurious findings, spurious uh, research results coming out and drugs being approved that are not safe or effective. Okay. All right, so that's some discussion on this problem, and um, you know, leave some comments in the YouTube uh, in, in the YouTube uh, comment section below, and I'll have another video for next week. All right, bye.